This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, it's my great pleasure right now to introduce to you my old friend and colleague, Jeff Pyatt, uh, who has the rather jaw-crunching title of Principal Deputy Secretary of State uh, for South and Central Asia. That job known in the trade as PDAS is a key position. And uh, Jeff, who is recognized as one of the rising stars of the U.S. Foreign Service, has participated, indeed led, uh, many of the key developments uh, in India-U.S. relations uh, that uh, took place during his watch, most notably uh, the preparations and the execution uh, of the visit of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh to the United States in 2009, and the visit just a few months ago of President uh, Obama uh, to uh, India. Foreign Service recommends uh, to its new recruits that they focus on two different parts of the world. Another way of putting that in academic terms is to have a major and a minor. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeff Pyatt uh, has followed uh, this advice. His major has been Asia, and particularly with a focus on South Asia. And at the same time, he has minored in uh, Latin American affairs. Uh, he's had substantial experience both in the field and in the department dealing with South Asia. Uh, he was twice assigned to the very important U.S. Embassy uh, in New Delhi, uh, rising on the second occasion uh, to the position of Deputy Chief of Mission. He's also served in Pakistan uh, as principal officer in Lahore, uh, a position I'm quite sure uh, he would not like to take back today. Um, and he served in Hong Kong. Uh, his experience in Latin American affairs has included uh, an assignment to Tegucigalpa uh, and uh, work uh, in the uh, uh, department uh, on uh, Latin American uh, matters. Uh, just before returning to Washington, he was also Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Mission to the International Atomic Energy Agency and other international organizations uh, in Vienna. Uh, Jeff was educated uh, in his native uh, California, where he received a BA in political science uh, from UC Irvine. And then he did graduate work uh, in international relations at Yale, where he received a master's degree. And so we're really delighted uh, to have this true authority on U.S.-Indian relations here to speak with us this afternoon. And Jeff, uh, wonderful to see you. Good. Thank you, Ambassador Schaefer. Um, I should start out by, by adding that um, the reason they advise us in the State Department when we're coming in to have a major and minor is so that you have a fallback if you really mess up in one part of the world. So um, I hope I won't be needing my Latin America skills anytime soon as a result of the discussion today. Um, but uh, in any case, let me, let me start off by offering um, real thanks to Emory University for the, the invitation to this conference and for giving me an excuse for a, a long, long overdue visit to Atlanta. Um, I'm especially pleased to be here today. It's always good to be out of Washington, but I'm especially pleased to be here today 
because my last um, trip out of Washington was uh, about two weeks ago, um, and I had the opportunity to be in Singapore, hosted by um, the U.S. <laughs> ambassador there, David Edelman. Um, ambassador Edelman is a, a hugely supportive graduate of this law school, in fact, of Emory Law School. Uh, we also have an Emory Law School graduate working on the India desk at the State Department today. So I've got lots of people who are encouraging me to take this invitation, and thank you to Ambassador Creekmore for giving me the opportunity. Um, I should also reiterate special thanks to, um, to Howard Schaefer for the, the, the really gracious introduction. Um, both Howie and his wife, Tezi, are, are two of the State Department's leading experts on South Asia. Um, and their involvement and service to the U.S. government over the past four decades um, has made as much as, of a mark on our relationship with this part of the world as, as any two people have, um, and is certainly threaded throughout the issues that I'll be discussing in my, my remarks today. Um, let me start out by, by flagging a couple of issues that I'd like to sort of put on the table, and then I do hope to leave as much time as possible for, uh, for discussion afterwards. Um, I imagine that most of the people in the audience today are familiar with the broad strokes of President Obama's visit last November to, uh, to India. So what I'd like to do right now is just hone in on two of the most notable areas of progress that we achieved in the course of that visit um, and to talk a little bit about how we hope to capitalize on these accomplishments in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, I would say as a sort of top-line message um, coming off of a, a very successful presidential visit to, to India, probably one of the most successful presidential trips to South Asia ever, um, I think the, the challenge that we face and a challenge on which we need help from India experts, India watchers, and members of the Indian diaspora like many of the people in the audience today is to define an agenda for both of the, the governments um, that capitalizes on what we achieved in the course of the President's visit and meets the very, very ambitious vision for a global strategic partnership that President Obama and Prime Minister Singh have agreed. Um, in terms of highlighting the visit, let me, let me start out um, with the issue of, of defense cooperation, which really is a cornerstone of the, um, of the bilateral U.S.-India relationship. Um, I was delighted to be able to hear Steve Cohen today. There are a few people who've thought about these issues as, as much as, as Professor Cohen has. Um, defense has, has long been the pointy end of the spear when it comes to the changes in the, in the U.S.-India relationship. I can vividly remember um, an occasion in May of 2002, and two things happened in May of 2002. Um, our then ambassador, Robert Blackwell, gave an infamous speech um, where he referred to the U.S.-India economic relationship as being flat as a chapati. Um, and that, that stuck with us for quite a while. Um, but the other really important development that happened that month was um, an exercise in May that involved uh, U.S. Special Forces uh, doing a paradrop over Agra uh, and the Taj Mahal. And I, I can vividly remember the front page headlines um, in New Delhi and the, especially the photographs that came out at the time because this was the, the first complex U.S. exercise that we had done in India in about three decades. Um, and it was viewed widely um, as breaking substantial new ground. Uh, today, on the other hand, um, India exercises with the U.S. military more than it does with any other military in the world. And I think that says an awful lot about how far and how fast our defense partnership has progressed. Um, these exercises, the service exchanges, senior defense visits that have happened to India span all four branches of our military, Army, Air Force, um, Navy, and Marines. Um, and they are important not just for the habits of cooperation that they've helped to produce, um, but also um, for the way in which they've served to reinforce the, the mutual high esteem um, in which our services and service chiefs hold each other. Um, and at a moment when there are a broad range of military and security related issues from counter piracy to disaster preparedness, um, where we have shared interests and shared approaches, these exercises are important because they help build habits of interoperability um, at a moment when we are facing many of the same challenges um, from the India Ocean region across to the Asia Pacific writ large. Um, one of the stars of that exercise in 2002 was a U.S. Air Force C-130 aircraft. And uh, six years later, in 2008, India agreed to purchase six C-130Js um, 
the first of which, in fact, was just inducted into the Indian Air Force. Um, this is a very important transaction, and I probably don't need to tell many folks in this room um, that the C-130 is actually manufactured just around the corner from us in, in Marietta. Um, so this defense sale was important symbolically as a, a reflection of our strengthened defense partnership, but it's also very, very important uh, because of the impact it has on the Georgia economy and the degree in which, to which um, these defense transactions um, are an important part of balancing our overall uh, trade relationship. But the C-130Js and the, the fact that they were delivered on time and on budget um, is really just the first chapter of what we hope will be a much longer and, and more ambitious uh, defense sales partnership. Um, the Indian government is in the final stages of uh, finishing up a $4.1 billion sale uh, for 10 C-17 heavy lift Globemaster aircraft. Um, sadly, not manufactured in Marietta, but definitely manufactured in the United States. Um, the, this, this transaction was announced during President Obama's visit. When it's completed, this sale will double the value of U.S.-India defense trade and provide India a strategic airlift capability and a humanitarian response capability that is unique in its region. Um, when these aircraft are all delivered, India will have the second largest C-17 fleet in the world after the United States. And I think that says a lot about how India's own strategic horizons are expanding and how India is developing the, uh, the hardware toolkit uh, to go with its expanding uh, vision of its role in the world. Um, but the, the value of these sales for the United States is not just monetary, because they come with a whole package of relationships, doctrinal exchanges, joint training, all of which helps to strengthen India's role as a force for good in Asia and indeed beyond. There's one specific defense sale in the future that I'd like to highlight today because it's so large and, and important. That's the, uh, the pending purchase of 126 medium multi-role combat aircraft, what we call the MRCA, M-M-R-C-A. Um, two American planes are part of this competition, um, uh, Boeing's F-18 and Lockheed Martin's F-16. Uh, they're among the contenders, and we believe we have brought to the table a very, very strong package. Um, the U.S. proposals um, that are part of this tender will um, dramatically enhance India's own aerospace industrial base and its defense capabilities, and we believe will demonstrate our capability and our willingness to share with India the most cutting-edge technologies, um, including, um, and this will sound arcane, but it's important, the world's only operationally mature advanced electronically scanned array radar. Um, Lots of words, what it, what it means, though, is a very, very sophisticated next generation electronic radar system, um, which we have been prepared to um, uh, release to India as part of this sale. And it reflects our preparedness to engage India as one of our really closest defense partners. And that reflects a dramatic change in terms of where India fits in the, the U.S. strategic map of the world. Um, our Commerce Secretary, uh, Secretary Locke, um, was in India earlier this month, and he highlighted the fact that uh, technology trade and technology sales are really going to be a cornerstone of the U.S.-India economic relationship as we, we go forward. India is expected to s purchase something like $45 billion um, of military modernization equipment um, over the next half decade or so, and the United States is looking for many additional opportunities to offer India superior technology and to further deepen our defense cooperative relationship. Um, when Secretary Locke was, was in India recently, um, he attended the premier Indian aeronautical expo, um, a thing called Aero India that takes place in Bangalore. Um, and uh, it was important to us that we had both the F-18 and F-16s there, but it was equally important that another centerpiece of the show was the, the, one of those C-130Js built here in Marietta because it demonstrates the fact that we're not just talking about this, we're actually doing things in terms of our defense sales relationship. Um, the second area I'd like to talk about for a couple of minutes on the U.S.-India agenda is, is the, the economic partnership. Um, I would say today that the, the task on the economic side is to elevate our government to government economic partnership to be commensurate with our robust global strategic partnership. In this regard, and I like the way Secretary Clinton has put this, the challenge for us in Washington or in New Delhi is to keep pace with the ambition and velocity of our private sector colleagues in Mumbai and New York or Ahmedabad and Atlanta. 
That is, we, we in government need to keep pace with what's happening in the private sector, which is really the driver of this. Um, U.S.-India economic cooperation, as Ambassador Schaefer pointed out this morning, has been a real driver of our transformed bilateral relationship. Um, and in many ways is the decisive factor behind India's changing place in the international system. Bilateral trade between our countries is flourishing, and Indian investment in the United States is increasing substantially. And that's been one of the major changes I would cite in the past few years. The pace of Indian innovation has been staggering. You have companies like Wipro, whose vice president was speaking to the, to the audience yesterday, have really redefined what it means to be an Indian company. A company, a company like Wipro has 16 offices in the United States, thousands of highly skilled jobs um, involving Americans who are helping, and through its activities both here and in India, is helping to drive growth in both countries. So we've come a long way from the days of the license rush, and we've, we have developed a relationship in, and a relationship between the U.S. and Indian economies in which what happens in India is directly linked to global markets and is vital to our own economic competitiveness and prosperity here in the United States. In this regard, I think one of the most important messages of President Obama's trip to India was to reinforce the notion that trade between India and the United States helps both countries and indeed helps to create jobs in the United States. It's worth noting in this regard that the first cabinet level visit to India after the president was Commerce Secretary Locke. And it, it's also significant that besides his meetings with, with government officials, Secretary Locke spent a great deal of time with business leaders in sectors like aviation, civil nuclear, defense, information, communication, and technology. And a lot of the American companies that were with him were not just the big giants, the Boeings of the world, but also small and medium-sized enterprises that are so much the backbone of the, the U.S. economy. Um, there are a lot of opportunities on the horizon. Uh, one of my favorite statistics is that 80 percent of the infrastructure of the India of 2030 has yet to be built. And all of you who've traveled frequently in India know what I mean when I talk about all the infrastructure that still has to be built. I'd like to provide a little further context with three statistics that in my mind illustrate how important the U.S.-India economic partnership is going to be to both nations. India's GDP today is 10 times what it was 20 years ago. Think about that. 10 times. Um, what was then a closed economy is now our 12th largest tra trading partner in terms of goods, with tremendous scope for further expansion. India is the world's second fastest growing major economy today, and is projected to become the world's third largest economy around 2025. India is also rapidly on its way to becoming the world's most populous country. Ambassador Schaefer pointed out that I, I, I've just come off of three years in Europe, and one of the things you feel immediately um, coming back to South Asia and especially in, in India is the huge demographic advantage that India enjoys at a time when much of the industrialized world in China are facing rapidly declining birth rates and rapidly aging populations. In India, on the other, other hand, half of the population is today under 25, um, which provides a, a demographic edge that I think few people anticipated even a decade or two ago. Um, with business-to-business -business engagement at the vanguard of our relations, um, these kind of statistics point to the enormous potential for even greater innovation and business development between our two knowledge-based societies. The task for us in government, therefore, as I said before, is to continue to keep opening doors for greater private sector engagement. Um, in doing so, we are aware of the multiple people-to-people -people connections that define and will help to deepen the U.S.-India relationship, particularly on the business front. In this regard, I, I'm, I should point out that the Atlanta Indian American community includes an awful lot of people who are reflective of, of this human bond. Um, I know some of you are here today, and I would just both um, thank you for your efforts on the part of the, the U.S.-India relationship, but also underline that from the State Department side, we're very keen to work with you, and we recognize that fostering this diaspora relationship is in, terribly important in terms of building the long-term foundation of the U.S.-India relationship. Um, with a total market of $1.2 billion and per capita incomes forced to, forecasted to grow at about 8 percent over the next several years, India's market promises U.S. companies continued strong demand for goods and services. For that reason, but also because it will support India's continued rise as a global power, we want to be India's partner of choice in building the railroads, airports, power plants, and fiber optic networks needed to sustain India's impressive economic pace. Between 2002 and 2009, the value of U.S. goods exported to India quadrupled, 
and U.S. services exports to India more than tripled. Recently released trade data for 2010 suggests that our commercial ties have rebounded strongly from the global slowdown with 30 percent growth in two-way merchandise trade, 30 percent in 2010. In thinking about the implications of India's economic rise and the opportunities that presents, however, we should see India not just as a market for our businesses, but also as a strategic partner whose increasing international role complements U.S. power. The U.S. endorsement of an expanded United Nations Security Council with India as a permanent member, what Ambassador Schaefer referred to earlier, should be viewed in that context. India's expanding global economic stakes have reinforced its readiness to share responsibility for security in Asia, safeguarding sea and air routes on which much of the global economy today depends. And it's very much in the U.S. India for India, in the U.S. interest for India to build on this international role in the years ahead. So what does a global strategic partnership between the United States and India mean for the rest of the world? A good place to start thinking about these issues is one of my favorite recent books by Robert Kaplan, which is called Monsoon, which offers a marvelous appraisal of how vital the Indian Ocean is to both India's strategic calculus and also our global economy. And just to pull a couple of quick examples, some choice statistics from, from Kaplan's book. The Indian Ocean is surrounded by 37 countries re representing a third of the world's population. 40% of the seaborne crude oil passes through the Strait of Hormuz. Half of the world's container traffic traverses the Indian Ocean. 70% of all petroleum products go through the Indian Ocean. And 90% of India's oil needs will come from the Persian Gulf through the Arabian Sea. All of this points to the importance of this space. And again, I come back to Ambassador Schaefer's presentation this morning. And her comment about the importance of building habits of collaboration between our two navies in this Indian Ocean space. With the fulcrum of geopolitics shifting quickly to Asia, India plays an increasingly critical role in U.S. global strategy. Indeed, amid the democratic transformation of Egypt and continuing unrest in Bahrain, Libya, and Yemen, India's value as an anchor of democratic stability in the Indian Ocean region has only increased. Few would disagree that furthering India's engagement with East Asia is in the United States' strategic interest. We need to work together to strengthen the bonds that tie our two nations, the world's oldest and largest democracies, with the economic and social dynamism that stretches from Hyderabad to Hanoi and from Mumbai to Macau. We strongly welcome this recent progress in East Asian and Southeast Asian bilateral relations with India and hope that New Delhi will further build on these steps and, as President Obama put it in his visit, adopt a Be East policy that seeks to expand its market and security integration across the region and enhance its role in Asian multilateral fora. Indian strategic analysts are grappling with some of the same issues. And for instance, somebody who's a friend of several of us here, uh, Ambassador S.D. Mooney, who's, who's based in Singapore now, observed that India's rich cultural heritage can ring many sympathetic chords in the region and its multi-religious, secular, and democratic ethos, as well as in music, arts, and architecture, theater, and cinema. All of these are elements of India's soft power, the ability of a state to achieve its strategic goals through the projection of cultural dynamism and robust institutions, rather than sheer military force. India will benefit immensely from an Asia that grows up on Bollywood films, studies at esteemed Indian universities, and enjoys wide-ranging people-to-people ties. In this context, we welcome the fact that other large Asia-Pacific democracies, Indonesia, Japan, Australia, South Korea, are also engaging more closely with New Delhi and cooperating more systematically on security and economic issues. Let me wind up by talking a little bit about India's role in South Asia as we see it. One of the keys to India's emergence as a more forceful actor in the Asia-Pacific region is New Delhi's success in navigating its complicated regional relationships, something that Howie described very well in his presentation. Indian Foreign Secretary Nirupama Rao also spoke to this issue um, in a speech she gave last fall at Harvard, and I'd like to quote for a second, because Foreign Secretary Rao noted that India's emergence as a global power requires a peaceful and stable neighborhood and external environment. Indeed, I would argue that India's emergence as an Asian power, which President Obama celebrated in his visit to New Delhi, will only benefit from further progress in social and economic integration in South Asia. Um, not so long ago, Secretary Clinton launched a new State Department analysis, um, something called the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, 
and since we have to have initials for everything in Washington, I'll call it the QDDR. Um, in that, Secretary Clinton highlighted the U.S. intention to elevate cooperation with regional organizations as an integral part of the U.S. strategy for global engagement. The major regional organization in India's immediate neighborhood is the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, or SARC. The United States has been an official SARC observer since 2006, a role we pursued not only to bolster our bilateral relationships in the region, but also to encourage greater integration among the countries of South Asia. Over time, we hope that SARC will accelerate the movement of people, goods, and ideas throughout the subcontinent, helping to strengthen the fabric of international organizations that connects India to its neighbors in Southeast Asia. By encouraging overlapping spheres of cooperation among different regional organizations in this area, SARC, ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and BIMSTEC, we acknowledge the complicated landscape of the Indian Ocean region and the geopolitical and economic realities of 21st century Asia. For instance, SARC members can learn from ASEAN's increasingly active security and economic cooperation, while BIMSTEC provides a vehicle to build on the warming of relations between Dhaka and New Delhi. Today, for the first time, almost all the countries on India's eastern periphery, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Nepal, have democratically elected governments in place stabilizing South Asia and helping India to think more ambitiously about its role in Southeast Asia. Pakistan, too, continues on a democratic path that is important both to India and to the United States. The institutionalization of democracy among India's neighbors remains a work in progress, but like Latin America, where a few decades ago democracy was the exception and is now the rule, I'm confident the region will follow the Indian model towards greater democratic consolidation. Let me talk for just a second about India-Pakistan relations that were featured this morning. In the United States' engagement with South Asia, one of our overarching objectives is to facilitate economic linkages and opportunities for all in the region. Reinvigorating trade and commerce between India and Pakistan can provide extensive benefits to both countries and their millions of farmers, business people, and entrepreneurs. Freer movement of people and goods across South Asia, including between India and Pakistan, will generate new economic opportunities for one of the world's youngest and most vibrant populations. At the moment, South Asia is one of the least economically integrated regions in the world. While accounting for nearly 23% of the world's total population, the region's share of GDP is less than 3%. In terms of trade linkages, SARC stands in sharp contrast to regional forums in East Asia. The pace of economic integration in the Asia-Pacific region over the last two decades was unprecedented and serves as an example for other regions. It should, and I believe can, be replicated in South Asia. Just as the private sector did in ASEAN, trade associations such as the Confederation of Indian Industry and the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry can play a significant role in improving trade relations between India and Pakistan. Recently, FICI set up two well-received Made in Pakistan business and products expositions in India, and now FICI is planning to organize a similar Made in India exhibition for Pakistan, which and is doing so working closely with the Federation of Pakistan Chambers and Chambers of Commerce and Industry. And in this regard, I think the, the, the ground up support for trade normalization is a significant phenomenon. Clearly, there is pent up demand for trade between India and Pakistan, as demonstrated for the, by the volume of trade that transits third countries to avoid restrictions or endures cumbersome offloading and reloading that occurs at the land border. Some analysts estimate the trade between India and Pakistan could be more than 10 times what it is currently if both governments work together to relax economic restrictions on cross-border trade. To provide some context, official bilateral trade between India and Pakistan reached $2.75 billion in 2009, up from about $215 million in 2001. But those numbers will only grow as India's consumer class expands. Last week, there was a wonderful article in the Washington Post that highlighted the missed opportunities from the current state of affairs. In that article, there was quoted a frustrated Indian merchant who said this, quote, I had 400 trucks stuck on the other side. For a week, these onions were standing there, and eventually they had to be sold within Pakistan for half the price. Who loses? Both countries, he said. Both countries, indeed. In this context of unfulfilled possibilities, we applaud the positive outcome of the recent foreign secretary talks between India and Pakistan and the announcement of a renewed dialogue on the full range of issues. This is a very important opportunity for both governments to explore important items on their agenda, and we hope that progress can be made. 
Against this background, I'd like to close um, this very quick review of the U.S.-India bilateral relationship and India's regional relationships with a quote that addresses both the desire and the potential for closer India-Pakistan relations. It comes from Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in 2007. At the time, Prime Minister Singh said, quote, I earnestly hope that relations between our two countries become so friendly and we can generate such an atmosphere of trust between each other that the two nations would be able to agree on a treaty of peace, security, and friendship. I dream of a day while retaining our respective identities, one can have breakfast in Amritsar, lunch in Lahore, and dinner in Kabul. That is how my forefathers lived, and that is how I want our grandchildren to live. Words to live by. So with that, um, I think I'll wrap up. Be happy to take any questions. And again, thank you so much to Emory for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for that uh, succinct and authoritative review of where things stand in U.S.-Indian uh, relations and where we hope they will further progress. So let's open uh, the floor to questions. Uh, please be sure that you have a mic uh, and identify yourself. And here's the first one right here. Hi, my name is Zishan. I'm a senior in the college. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, the mission that's going to be happening in Bangalore, and maybe in the context of, uh, of, of, I guess, the nuclear military? Um, I don't know if, you know if they're planning on uh, expanding their uh, nuclear capabilities and what that may mean um, in terms of uh, a political sense to, to other nations. Uh, it's a good question. Let me put it this way, and I think I sh should first say um, I think India has to speak for itself in terms of how it's going to develop its security posture. Certainly from a U.S. standpoint, the emergence of an India which is a more forceful actor in the international system and more capable is a very good thing. And I'll give you a good example from today's headlines. Um, a few years ago, um, we were involved in the first major U.S. naval sail uh, to India which was a, a, a ship, an LPD, which is a landing ship called the USS Trenton, which is now the, the Jalshaba. Um, that ship is being used now, is now steaming to Libya, and India plans to use that ship, um, according to press reports, to help to evacuate some of its personnel uh, from, uh, from Libya. So what you have, you have an India which is becoming more militarily capable, um, it is developing an over-the-horizon expeditionary capability. Um, and because of what India is, because India is a democracy, because India is a status quo power um, in terms of the international security system, because India is interested in maintaining the openness to, uh, to international trade, for commerce, all of that means that an India which is becoming more capable um, is good for the United States. It's obviously good for India, and again, I, I would emphasize you know, the question of what India hopes to become militarily is better addressed to an Indian official than an American one. But from the American standpoint, I would say it is good for us to have an India which emerges as a much more active player on the international stage. Um, as I said in my prepared remarks, um, I think this should be understood as being driven first and foremost by India's expanding connection to the global economy. Um, and the fact that India, like other rising international powers, has discovered that its interests do not end at the water's edge and that it, its own security and prosperity is vitally affected by what happens in its near abroad and beyond. So now it is, as one would expect, beginning to develop the military capability that it needs to, project, to protect those interests. But I would emphasize, from a U.S. standpoint, this is completely non-threatening. And in fact, it's a welcome development because of the role that India has historically played. Uh, Jack Sheth, I'm a professor of business here and on the board of Wipro as an independent board member for about 11 years. The, in the defense industry, uh, you know, a large component <coughs> probably will be the offset business, yes. direct offset as opposed to indirect offset. Uh, that would mean that uh, in India, obviously, you will have subcontractors, component makers, would they be going global in the process? In other words, would they serve the large prime contractors in this country who in the DOD accounts, for example, will they be allowed to have Indian subcontractors to work to supply and therefore expansion of the Indian subcontractors, like in the automotive sector, what's happening, you know, or what's happening in pharma? How do you see that architecture, let's say 10 years from now, 
will there be a significant presence of Indian manufacturers locating themselves here to supply for their prime contractors like the Lockheeds and the Boeings of the world, Northrop Grumman, et cetera? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, gr great question. And I think um, it should be understood in the context of India's engagement with the global economy. Um, one, one friend of mine made the point once that, that India had, as we would say in the United States, a shotgun wedding with the global economy. India's engagement with the global economy, which began with the financial crisis of 1991, was not something that Indian elites chose. It was imposed on them. But ironically, if one looks at what's happened in the, in the subsequent two decades, India has been one of the great winners from the phenomenon of globalization largely because of the ingenuity and energy of the Indian private sector and companies like Wipro and Tata and Reliance and everybody else. Um, I think the defense sector lags behind in that regard. Um, India's defense sector is still largely parastatal, state-owned. Um, Professor Cohen has a whole book on this topic out on the front table that you can buy for 20 bucks. Um, and that will have to change if India's defense industry is to become globally competitive. I think one of the, the great benefits that could arise from the offset policy and the impact that the offset policy has on India's defense procurement process is to accelerate the insertion of Indian private companies into the, um, into the defense and defense aerospace sectors. Um, the offsets are a fact of Indian law um, it's important, I think, from our standpoint, from the U.S. standpoint, that those be applied in a way that allows the broadest possible U.S. private sector engagement with Indian counterparts. And in that regard, we welcomed the news not so long ago that the categories of activity allowable under the DPP, the Defense Procurement Policy, would be expanded to include areas like technical education, security equipment and systems. Um, that's a welcome development. But I think what you, you will find happens over time is that as large American companies um, receive de defense procurement contracts and they find that they have large offset obligations to fulfill, they will naturally gravitate towards the successful Indian private sector companies who are all known from, from Davos and from the international economy that we all live in. And so I think, um, the, the real, one of the advantages of this um, burst of defense procurement that India is about to go through, if properly handled, um, is the development of a much more robust Indian private sector um, defense capability. Um, I would argue that India is more likely to develop that desirable capability by working with American companies than working with um, some of our challengers from other parts of the world who, are, who look more like the parastatal model that was historically the pattern in India. Um, a company like Boeing or Lockheed Martin is going to gravitate to partners um, from the Indian private sector. And indeed, that's already starting to happen. I think I saw a headline this week about a new partnership between um, Tata and, and Lockheed. Um, Boeing, of course, has done much of the same. And I think you're going to see more and more of that kind of thing over time. Can I follow up with one more question? Sure. Ambassador. Um, do you see increasing role of U.S.-India Business Council in this alignment that's taking place between India and the U.S.? A um, couple of thoughts. Uh, again, the, the Indian private sector, one of the, the great champions of the, um, uh, of the changed U.S.-India relationship has been the private sectors on both sides. And um, Ambassador Schaefer was nice enough earlier to talk about my work on the, the U.S.-India nuclear deal. Um, I was always struck when I was in India working on this. In New Delhi, of course, this was a topic of great controversy, this being the, the broader U.S.-India strategic partnership. Um, outside of New Delhi, in, in Bangalore or Bombay or Chennai, um, people would ask you, what took so long? Uh, it was a very different outlook on the uh, relationship between the, the two countries. And I think it reflected the, both the, um, the experience of India's private sector um, leaders, with leadership that by and large studied in the United States, had historic relationships with the United States, but also a recognition of where India's greatest economic advantage lay over time. 
that is, de the development of this economic partnership with the United States is, is hugely important to India as it is important to the United States. Um, one of the, I think one of the more useful things um, that we've done outside of government in terms of driving forward the, the relationship in recent years um, was the creation of the U.S.-India CEOs Forum. Um, and I must say, having participated both on the India end, but then also having, having sat in on the, the meeting of the CEOs Forum that took place in Washington last summer, um, and we had people around the table. We had Mr. Ambani there. We had Mr. Tata. We had Karen Mazumdar Shah. These are people who are absolutely world-class business people making decisions involving literally billions of dollars of capital. Um, and the fact that all of these Indian business leaders are viewed with such high regard by their American counterparts, but that they're also all invested in making this relationship work right, I think says a lot about the catalytic role that the private sector has to play. Um, now, lest I be accused of being um, you know, completely uh, rosy-eyed about all of this, uh, we are two big, complex democracies and making the relationship right in the context of our respective democratic processes is always a challenge. Um, I don't think it's any, any great secret to note that in Delhi today, the political environment for moving ahead on economic reform is challenging. I think the prime minister and his government are completely committed, um, but the politics have become more complicated in recent months. Um, likewise, in the United States, as we've gone through this painful process of economic adjustment um, over the past few years, the whole debate over the role of U.S. engagement with the global economy has, has played itself out. I think the good news is at the end of this process, you have at both the private sector level and at the top leadership level, President Obama, Prime Minister Singh, a strong recognition of our shared stakes. And I, I, again, I, I fall back on something I said in my prepared remarks, which is um, I think one of the most important messages that President Obama was delivering to both of his audiences when he traveled in India in November was that this is an economic relationship which works, which is good for both countries. Um, it's been good for India. Um, India has been, as I said, one of the great winners of globalization, but it's also very important to long-term economic competitiveness. And I would argue, you know, like the bicycle, if we don't keep moving forward, we're gonna fall over. We need to keep driving it forward. And as I said, on the government side in particular, we need to keep setting ambitious goals for ourselves so that we continue to identify where the cutting edge of the economic relationship lies and how to expand those relationships. Um, I didn't do it in this speech. I, I've spoken not till so long ago about a lot of the changes that happened in U.S. export control policy around President Obama's visit to, to India. Um, that too, I think, should be understood as an effort by us in government both to acknowledge India as a good partner on nonproliferation issues, but equally important um, as a reflection of our understanding that if we want to accelerate this high technology partnership between our two economies and our two countries, we have to make sure that we're clearing away all of the, all of the roadblocks. That question right here. <clears throat> Um, I'm Narayanan Komarath. I'm a professor of aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech across town. And I, 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 I think you just answered the first part of my question. Um, we, we see these movements towards cooperation in space and, and uh, defense with great pride and joy. I think it's a great thing to be happening. And at the same time, uh, from our viewpoint inside a U.S. institution, uh, when we try to initiate collaborative efforts, we run into this huge red flag of ITAR. Right. And, and uh, could you comment a little bit more about what the government is doing to, to try to rationalize this process? Yeah, let me, um, let me, let me uh, decode the question a little bit for the rest of the audience. ITAR is the international regulation which governs transfer of munitions items, which by law the State Department controls. Um, I think I, I would come back to what I said about the, the MERCA, the, the fighter aircraft co uh, competition. Um, we have come a very, very long way in terms of the United States' desire to treat India on par with our closest partners on these questions of defense and technology transfer. 
Um, the fact that we have explicitly <coughs> made the decision to release to India as part of the Merca competition, this advanced electronically scanned array ADAR, radar is terribly important because it is, first of all, it's the only one operative in the world. We're the only ones who have it right now, so it's only Lockheed Martin and Boeing that are bringing this to the competition. Um, but it's also very much cutting edge in terms of the capabilities um, that it, it provides to an aircraft that is so equipped. Um, so the regulations still exist. We are doing as much, because they are written into our law, but we are doing as much as we can to streamline the process through which those regulations are implemented, including, I, would, I should note as well, during President Obama's visit to the United States, the announcement of the removal of two important Indian institutions, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, their NASA, and DRDO, um, the, India's premier defense research organization. Um, both have been removed from the Commerce Department entities list. Um, that doesn't mean the requirement for licenses goes away. We're, we're from the federal government, so we still have this regulatory role that we can't get away from. Um, but it does mean that India is in a preferred category now in terms of how those licenses are processed. And I think you're seeing, coming back to your question on ITAR, um, I think you are seeing the, uh, a, a much improved situation in terms of the, the speed with which the State Department is able to process these kinds of license requests. And I can certainly assure you that the attitude which surrounds India when these kinds of issues now come into our decision-making process is not one which says stop. It's one which says, good, let's see how we build on this relationship. Next question. Uh, my question is more to do with your you know, past, ex past experience as well in both China and Latin America. Sure. And uh, I would like to know what would be your thoughts or take on uh, kind of doing a parallel comparison of the Indian space in this sector and kind of looking at, you know, what are the, the key challenges or, you know, how does it evolve, the evolution of relationships with the U.S. when it comes to these three nations? Because there's also a lot of South-South dialogue that's happening where, you know, U.S. is not really at the table, but a lot of dialogue is being happening on the trade front as well as on the military front. Uh, on these other countries. So I would like to just kind of get your brief comments on that. Yeah, no, a really good question. I, I, I'm tempted to empty, answer it glibly, which is the thing about Latin America is you don't have jet lag when you travel there, which for somebody in my business, as one becomes older, is more and more of a factor. Um, but seriously, um, and I should emphasize, um, I've lived nine years in the Indian subcontinent. I've lived only three years in Hong Kong. Um, I am by no stretch or means any kind of a China expert. Um, but I think... Um, I would just draw this as, as a comparison um, and sort of reference points. Um, again, to quote um, Ambassador Blackwell on flight as a chapati, it really is striking to me that as recently as, as 2002, um, there was great, great skepticism in official America about the trajectory of the Indian economy. And certainly, um, you know, even more, uh, even more distant, I remember when I left India first in 1994, there were an awful lot of people in the Indian political system who would have been very happy to roll back the clock and were not at all happy with how the economic reform process was impacting their lives. Um, that's now changed beyond recognition. Um, economic liberalization is irreversible. The constituency for economic modernization in India is immense. Um, and India's own expectations of itself are changing almost beyond recognition. Um, but it's important to remember that this is a process of reform and opening um, that began um, about a decade behind China. So when I was in China, um, and I was, I was in Hong Kong during the process of negotiating China's WTO accession, um, so the late 1990s, one could argue that China then was um, not that far from where India is today in terms of the, the time during which the process of economic reform had been unfolding. And again, it sort of brings me back to one of the points I made in the prepared remarks. If you look at the basic economic indicators, the headroom in the India-US economic story is so tremendous. And as much as people talk today about the importance of the Indian economy and India as a driver of the global economy, 
we're really just seeing the first stages of this, of this process. And importantly, um, at a time when many other major economies are struggling because they are driven, their economic dynamism is driven, driven by an export-led model. That's not the Indian model. India's economic model is driven by domestic growth. It's driven by hundreds of millions of people in the middle class looking for new, econ new opportunities, going out and buying scooters and air conditioners and color televisions and everything else. So, um, you know, I think that, that suggests, um, you know, one needs to, to use a sort of a different set of lenses when you're looking at the two, at the two situations, leaving aside the, the enormous differences in terms of the political systems. The fact that, that India is a real democracy where everything has to be debated, sometimes debated to death, um, whereas China is not, which means that economic decisions are made very quickly and once made can be implemented um, without too much, um, too, much, too much difference. And I, again, as somebody who lived in, in Delhi uh, for, uh, for five years, from uh, 2002 to 2007, I'll remember always the, um, the signs over the, the highway from, Delhi, from New Delhi out to the airport, and there was a sign that said to be completed in you know, May of 2003, which became August of 2003, which became 2004, I mean, and it, you know, it was India. So there, there, was, there was public interest litigation about trees that had to be cut down, and there were differences over um, where, to, where to, uh, to build specific ramps not that dissimilar from the kind of debate we have here in the United States. But lo and behold, you go to New Delhi today and the new airport is finished. Uh, the, the expressway from the airport to the city is there. You come in at night, you get in in 10, 10 or 15 minutes. It's pretty miraculous for those of us who remember the old, the old India. Um, but it's happened in a way that is conditioned by the ups and downs of Indian democracy. Um, and certainly in my case, I mean, one of the, one of the things that India has taught me over, over two decades is to be patient with those ups and downs because the overall trajectory is unambiguously upward. So I think, I, let me sort of leave it to that on the, the India-China side. My, my data on, on Latin America is so, so stale, um, I'd probably lead you astray if I tried to speak too much to that one. Next question. Back there. I teach in Emory College, and uh, yesterday somebody asked the ambassador about the uh, terrible problems that we have sending academics to India, yes. getting visas, and uh, I think Her Excellency kind of dodged the question by blaming it on uh, um, terrorism in uh, Mumbai, but I would like to know what our government is doing to get these restrictions lifted, or at least vastly eased so that those of us who aren't businessmen can also travel easily? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really, really good question and an excellent topic. Um, this has been, U.S.-India education partnership has been in many regards a great success. We have something like 100,000 Indian students studying in the United States today. Um, every one of those students who comes here contributes something to our society. Many of them will stay on. Um, and they will innovate and they will help to drive, um, drive growth here, and then they go home and they, bring, them, they bring, bring with them to India a different set of attitudes about the United States and working with the United States. Um, it is not the same story in terms of American students going to India, but it needs to become that over time. Um, when President Obama went to India, one of the things that we announced was an education summit uh, which will happen here in the United States early this summer. Um, and that will provide um, a venue for some real serious discussion about how we think more ambitiously about our education partnership at a time when more and more U.S. institutions are recognizing that to prepare their students for a global economy, they have to help their students to understand what it takes to succeed in a place like India. So um, the good news is this is an issue getting a lot of attention. It was striking to me um, during uh, the China state visit. We had Hu Jintao in Washington, and uh, the First Lady, Michelle Obama, did a big public event called 100,000 Strong, 
which highlighted China's, in, China's goal of bringing 100,000 American students to China in the years ahead. And um, we have not gotten to the same place in terms of the Indian government's desire to attract American students, American scholars. And as you say, the, the process of getting through visa applications and screening by the home ministry and everything else um, can be quite discouraging for people who are otherwise very well disposed towards India and the U.S.-India relationship. So this is an issue that we have to do better on. Um, I would not take Ambassador Shanker's unwillingness to offer any immediate promises of resolution as any kind of an indication that the government in Delhi is not seized of the matter, because I think they are. And we're just going to have to build, build the structures that allow us to do much better in this area, because, again, it's so important to both countries' long-term competitiveness. Yellow shirt. I'm Ishwar Mani. I'm a uh, private entrepreneur and uh, helping trade between India and U.S. in private enterprise. Uh, with the increasing trade that's happening in the last few years with India, and I think in the, same, in the context of uh, tariffs, um, India was given a most favored nation status at least a few years back. I uh, keep hearing that that is changing or is on the books to change those laws. So in that context between both the U.S. and Indian governments, how do you see that playing out uh, in all sectors, not just private enterprise, but also in the defense sector? Yeah. Um, I am not a trade policy lawyer, so I'm going to dodge some of the details on your questions. I will say this. Um, the United States economy has remained very open to Indian goods and services. Um, we also have benefited from the gradual opening of the Indian economy. Um, we hope very much that that, will, that, that, that opening, that process of opening, um, will accelerate um, in the years ahead. Int the interesting thing to me is the degree to which, and as I said, there, it wasn't so long ago that, that there were people in India who questioned the whole value of economic reform and economic <coughs> opening. You don't really hear that anymore in Delhi. Um, and one of the things that's changed dramatically about the political process in Delhi is that you now have much louder voices coming from the middle class saying, why should we go to Singapore to buy this? Or why, why can't we find product X at the local store? And I think the, 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 in the context of India's own democracy and a trade policy in India, which is going to be de defined by democratic consti constituency interests, um, the fact that you have an Indian middle class, which is increasingly agitating for opening and for India's global engagement will help to keep things moving in a positive direction. Um, this is, you know, th this, this trade relationship between us um, is, is, is one of India's very largest. Um, it has to be a two-way street. Um, one of the things that we celebrate about the U.S.-India economic relationship is that it is by and large in balance. Um, we don't have any gross imbalances in terms of the volume of goods and services going back and forth. It's also very important to me, and I think probably unprecedented, that the, the economic relationship is so highly concentrated at the top end of our two economies. That is, unlike so many other economic relationships, which are dominated by trade and commodities and simple products, um, a very important piece of the U.S.-India economic relationship resides at the very top end of, of both economies. India's high technology sectors, biotechnology, software, information technology, but also for the analogous American partners. And I think that's really, um, it's, that's a source of strength. It's also, in my mind, not a coincidence that the area of greatest success in terms of India's economic um, growth story has been in those sectors where the regulatory hand of government is lightest. Um, and I think there's a lesson there for India over time. But again, it's a democratic system. Um, unlike um, some other big Asian economies, you can't just you know, snap your hands and government policy is going to change. Uh, political leaders, economic policy makers like Prime Minister Singh, like Pranab Mukherjee, um, like Montek Singh Alawalia, these are all people who know exactly what needs to be done but they have to build the political constituency that allows the policy implementation process to succeed. 
Any more questions? <clears throat> well, Jeff. Uh, Marion's got one, I think. Uh, I don't do you have one? Okay. Uh, no, I just uh, was going to congratulate uh, Jeff on a great presentation, but I now see we have Ambassador Creekmore. Uh, Go ahead. Jeff, thank you very much for all you've done and for being here today. My question is based upon an assumption, and that is that there was a time when India and the U.S. talked past each other rather than to each other. That that has changed, and we can now not only talk to each <coughs> other, but we can find where our interests converge and build on those. And we've learned to be mature enough to accept that there are times when our interests diverge, and we just have to accept that. Uh, if that is a context you agree with, could you just say a few words about the whole issue of climate change and how that is being worked on both in Washington and in New Delhi? Yeah, gr great question. Um, and it's, it's also, it's, I don't know if everybody could hear the question, but it was about how the United States and India have acquired the ability to have really frank conversations about difficult issues in the international system and then sort of work our way to an agreement on what we want to do. Um, and I, it's, climate change is a great illustration, I think, of what's changing in the relationship because there was a time not so long ago um, when the debate in India focused on um, how India was, was developing late and needed the opportunity to, to make up for decades and decades of underdevelopment and they didn't really want to hear from us in terms of um, any bright ideas we had about steps that India might consider taking to affect climate change. Um, today, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, um, we have a climate change negotiator, Ambassador Todd Stern. Um, his counterpart is the Indian Minister Concern, Jairam Ramesh. Um, I think uh, Ambassador Stern uh, wouldn't mind me saying that I think one of his strongest international partnerships is with Jairam Ramesh. Um, it's a really candid, professional relationship. Um, if we look at the last round of Cancun talks, um, India's role was not just as an honest interlocutor with the United States. And in this diplomatic business, the sort of first hurdle you've got to get over is um, because diplomats, we're in the business of trying to take, uh, take, take an issue of contention and figure out where, the, where the, 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 the common ground of compromise might exist. The first hurdle in any kind of diplomatic negotiation like that is to start to figure out what's your counterpart really trying to say and are they being honest with me. And I think one of the great things about the conversation with, with Minister Ramesh is that um, Jairam is an honest interlocutor. Um, and we've, uh, we've respected um, our ability to have that kind of a conversation with him. But I, I would emphasize that as regards the climate change issue, um, not only do we have an excellent bilateral discussion where we talk candidly about our concerns and our policies and our initiatives, um, but India has really emerged as a global leader. And it, in my mind, is illustrative of a point I was trying to make in the, in the prepared remarks about um, the U.S. stake, the U.S. interest in India's emergence as a more powerful actor in the international system. India is not the United States. It's never going to be. And as I think Ambassador Schaefer, as Ambassador Schaefer pointed out, anybody who comes into the U.S.-India relationship imagining that this is going to be a junior partner kind of relationship hasn't spent enough time in South Block in New Delhi. Um, but the great thing is that um, an India which um, is pursuing its own national interests but which has a, can a candid dialogue with the United States and then goes into the multilateral arena and is advocating a course of action on its own behalf uh, can sometimes be more effective than the United States might be in helping to coalesce an international consensus. And I think that's a little bit of what happened in Cancun recently. So. Um, I think you know this is this is a good example. I was af I was afraid you were going to ask me to enumerate the issues on which we still disagree, and you will not be shocked to know that there are some of those. And but because I'm a glass half full kind of guy, I'd rather not focus on that. But climate change is not one of them. Uh, climate change has been one of the real success stories of the U.S.-India partnership. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.